Thank you. Okay, welcome back to Auburn, everybody. Um, we mentioned a while ago that variants came here from South America, and when invasive species do come in, most of the time they don't bring their natural enemies with them. And we have been working releasing some natural enemies against the fire ants, and what our hopes are is that we're going to enable our native ants to be able to compete against the fire ants on a more equal basis uh, once we bring in these parasites, predators, and pathogens for our um, um, native ants. Can everybody hear me okay? Or Okay, maybe this will be better. Um, one of the first things that we looked at uh, that have been looked at were bacteria. They've long been neglected as a biological control agent, and there are not many bacteria out there right now. So uh, the USDA is taking a look at some bacteria now, and they're looking in North and South America for isolates of these bacteria. Uh, another um, biological control agent that they have looked at uh, but uh, don't think will work here in the United States at this point in time is a parasitic ant in South America. It does go into the mound and use the workers for um, uh, basically to uh, raise their brood, but uh, the problem with this particular ant is that we think it might uh, attack some of our native ants here in America. Anyone that has ever reared insects in a lab no the problem that uh, you can have with fungi that will attack your colonies. Uh, and two of the main fungi that usually end up attacking colonies if you're trying to rear insects are Boveria bassiana. Um, let me see if I can find the arrow here, which is up here on the top picture, and uh, Metaresium, which is a greener colored fungi, which is down here in the bottom picture. Uh, these two fungi have both been known to attack fire ants, Boveria here at the top, and Metaresium at the bottom in wild and laboratory colonies, and pretty much these two fungi are native in the soil out here. And usually if you can find one of these products that works as an insecticide, it has to be a, a fairly virulent biotype since these uh, ants are exposed to it on a daily basis. Another fungi that has been uh, found to work on fire ants and kill them or was isolated from dying ants in the rearing of forward flies, again, in rearing facilities. And some of the studies are being considered to see if this aspergillus uh, can be transmitted uh, in fire ants. One of the more promising biological control agents is a virus that was discovered in 2004, and it was discovered in the red important fire ant, and so uh, Obviously, it was given the name Solenopsis in Victor Virus 1. It does infect all of the cast members of the colony and tends to cause uh, slow brood death, and it's currently under evaluation down at Gainesville, Florida at the USDA labs. Uh, moving on to some of the biological control agents that have been released and seem to be working somewhat, Nilhazia solenopsis is a microsporidia that causes uh, disease in fire ants and causes a slow demise of the colony. Uh, it's one of the more common pathogens down in South America, but it has been found in the United States. And the advantage to this is, is since it has been found in the United States, we don't have to worry about get quarantine restrictions when working with this particular microsporidia in the United States now. Uh, it has been released in the southern United States. It tends to be more effective in multiple queen colonies than it is in our single queen colonies here in the southeast. Um, and that makes sense because in multiple queen colonies, the ants will move from mound to mound and tend to carry the infection with them when they move, where the monogyne colonies are very territorial and don't have very much contact with uh, ants from other colonies. Another microsporidia that is being looked at is Barimorpha invicta, and when it's added to a colony that's infected with Neohasia, uh the result is that the colony dies quicker. And research is currently ongoing with these two pathogens down at the University of, uh, at the USDA labs in Gainesville, Florida, and is continuing here and in Argentina. You can see where Neohasia has been established in the United States, and I mentioned that the polygyne colonies tend to transmit the uh, microsporidia better. Uh, 
Texas has much more, many more polygon colonies than we do in the rest of the southeast, and you can see that Neil Hazy has spread uh, much faster throughout Texas than it has in the rest of the southeast where it was released. Okay, on to my favorite, which are the Ford flies. Um, there are over 20 species of Ford flies down in South America that attack uh, fire ants. Uh, these Ford flies are in the genus Sudacteon, and let me go ahead and say now, this Ford fly is not the Ford fly that attacks bumble, uh, honeybees. Uh, there's been several articles out that talk about Ford flies attacking honeybees, and um, they are in a different genus and are not the ones we're talking about today. Uh, we refer to these uh, flies fondly as decapitating flies uh, because what they do is they make the fire ants head fall off. Uh, they're really nifty critters. There are over 20 species of them in South America petition their resources so they don't all attack uh, the same way. Uh, we do have two species of fire ant here, the red and the black, and some attack the red, some attack the black. They attack different times of day. They attack different ant behaviors. They attack different size workers, and some attack at different times of the year. And the way these little guys work is they inject their egg into the body of an ant. It takes about one-tenth of a second for them to fly by and inject that egg. Uh, once the egg hatches, the maggot emerges, and it moves up into the head of the ant. And it lives there for quite a while until it pupates. And while the maggot is in the ant's head, it can affect ant behavior. We tend to think it does suppress foraging somewhat. And research down at Louisiana show that uh, some of the ants... Uh, Basically, it creates zombie ants that really sort of wander around and don't know what they're doing. Uh, the last maggot stages, uh, while it's in the head, causes the membranes between the ant's head and the ant's body to degenerate somewhat. And just before uh, the maggot pupates, it consumes the inside of the ant's head uh, and results in decapitation of the ant where the ant's head falls off which you can see down here in the bottom. And once the head does fall off, the little uh, last stage larva kicks off the antenna, it kicks off the mandibles, and uses the ant's head for its pupil case. Uh, it's a good system that the fly uses, and it uh, really doesn't take as much energy as a regular uh, pupae would that would have to harden itself all over. You can see in the bottom picture down here that only the top portion of the puparium has to be sclerotized. So this is a reduction in energy of what the fly has to use, and it uses the ant's head for its puparium. And the developmental time from egg until the fly emerges is about five to 12 weeks, and this is gonna depend on temperature. In the hot summer, we got five weeks. Uh, in the fall and early spring, when it's cooler, uh, closer to 12. The flies emerge just after sunrise. It doesn't take very long for them to pop out of the head capsule, and by noon, they're ready to mate, they're ready to lay their eggs, and each fly can lay between two and 250 uh, eggs and two to 250 ants. Uh, they only lay one egg per ant. Uh, how they know that the ant has an egg in it, I don't know, but uh, they will only lay egg in one ant, so they don't compete uh, for resources by fighting over ants. Uh, in the lab, these flies can live three to seven days, and we estimate that in the field they're only going to live for one to three days looking for ant workers. The first Ford fly that we released here in the United States was Pseudacteon tricuspis. Uh, it was released in the late 1990s. Uh, this particular, uh, I lost my pointer here. Here we go. Uh, this particular Ford fly likes workers that are medium to large size and prefers uh, the red imported fire ant. Uh, one thing to notice with the pictures that we have here, these are the ovipositors of the, of the females. Um, this is the only species, Sudacion tricuspis, that has males that we know of that come to the mounds if you disturb them. Uh, most of the other flies, when we're looking for them, we only have females come to the mounds. But the, the distinct ovipositors are, uh, are what we use to identify the different species of board fly when they do come to the mound. Uh, currently, we think this is the range of Pseudacteon tricuspis along the southeast. It has been released uh, in all of these states, and once it's established to the site, it moved out, moves out from the site at a rate of about 10 to 20 miles per year. 
the second species that was established here in the United States was Sudiacion curvatus, and there were two biotypes of curvatus that were brought into the United States. The first was uh, the Las Flores biotype that came off the black imported fire ant down in South America, and it preferred here in the United States the black imported fire ant and the hybrid between the red and the black imported fire ant. Uh, second uh, biotype, uh, the Formosa biotype, was brought in and released on Solenopsis and Victor here in the United States. And you can see the ovipositor of Curvatus, which is fairly large for its body size. It sort of looks like a hawkbill knife. Very indicative. Um, this particular fly likes small to medium-sized workers. And in most of the areas where it has uh, been established in its range, it tends to be the most prevalent fly now between uh, Curvatus and Tricustis. Uh, this is the estimated range for Pseudacteon curvatus across the southeast, and just like Tricuspis, again, it moved out from its uh, release sites at a rate of about 10 to 20 miles per year. A third species of fly that's been established here in the United States is Pseudacteon littoralis. It prefers larger workers, the biggest ones out there. Uh, it was released at seven sites in Alabama, Florida, and Louisiana between 2003 and 2005. Uh, it was only established in one site, and that was here in Alabama in Wilcox County. Since this fly does like larger workers, uh, we put it down in the Black Belt where we have some nice mounds down there that run 18 to 24 inches in height. And once you get them in the uh, Black Belt soils, the heavy clays we have, the mounds stay there for quite a while. This particular fly now is only as moved out from the Wilcox County site, and uh, last time we looked, we found it 14 miles away in Dallas County. A fourth fly that has been established in the United States is Sudacteon obtusus. It likes slightly smaller workers than Littoralis does. Uh, it was first established in Texas, released there in 2006. Uh, you can see the triangles on the map are areas where Pseudacian obtus obtusis is established in Texas. Uh, it was also released in Florida in 2008 and in Alabama in 2008 and 2010. It is established in Florida, but we have yet to find obtusis here in Alabama, and we're going to look again this summer. Uh, you can see here on the map the sites where obtusis are established right now in the southeast. Uh, hopefully it will start spreading uh, like Curvatus and Tricuspis did. Uh, fifth fly that has been released is Sudacteon cultilatus. It likes the smallest fire ant workers. And we think this might be uh, more effective in polygyn sites. Uh, we didn't mention on the polygyn multiple queen sites a while ago, but they tend to have smaller workers than do uh, monogyn or single queen sites. So like uh, Neil Hazia, uh, we think that cultilatus might be more effective in the polygyn areas where we do have polygyn colonies. Uh, it was released, released uh, in 2010 in Gainesville in Miami, Florida, and we did a release here in Alabama in 2011, and we will begin looking this summer to see if we found those. Uh, six species is Sudacion nosens that has been released in Texas. Uh, it was established in 2011. I mentioned earlier that there are over 20 species of this fly down in South America. They attack different times of day, different size ants, and we only have two, Sudacion curvatus and Sudacion tricuspis, well established in the south now where we have fire ants. Uh, some of the other flies are out there, but they're in sporadic locations. Uh, have not had a chance to spread and move into the population. So we right now only have some flies that will attack medium to large or small fire ants late in the afternoon and that go for disturbances. We don't have a good establishment of flies that attack on trails, um, that attack ants that are working around the nest. Uh, we don't have ants, uh, flies that attack at different times of day. So there's some voids in the ability of these flies to basically annoy fire ants 24-7, which is what we're looking for. The ability of the fire ants to uh, get rid of a, 
uh, excuse me, the ability of forward flies to affect fire ants, we think is going to be the fact that they really annoy fire ants and that fire ants won't be able to provision their nest and to be as aggressive as they were in the past. So uh, we do need to get more flies established to get that done. And one final thing, forward flies may be involved with transmitting pathogens. I mentioned that with, micro, with the fungi a while ago, uh, aspergillus, such as, uh, and other pathogens, such as microsporidia viruses. And if this is confirmed, then the role of these flies is going to become a Im more important biological control, too. And hopefully I did fast enough, Kathy.